from the heathens got will got fight got pride got reason if they want to go in the first part of the discussion they are talking about the course vj will study first you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7 Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello. May I help you? Hello. Uh, is this the right place for me to register to study foreign languages? Yes, it is. May I have your name, please? Vijay. My family name is Paresh. Vijay Paresh. OK. Do you have a telephone number? Yeah. 909-2467. Thank you. Now, which language would you like to learn? We offer French, Italian, Cantonese, Mandarin, Spanish, Portuguese. Um, I'd like to learn Spanish, please. OK. Our classes are conducted in lots of different places. We have classrooms in the city and here in this building. What's this building called? This is building A. I work near here, so it'd be best to study in building A. What time do you want to come to lessons? They go on for three hours and they start at 10 a.m., 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. I wish I could come to the daytime lessons, but I can't. So 6 p.m., please. That's our most popular time, of course. Um, have you ever studied Spanish before? No, I haven't. We describe our classes by level and number. Your class is called Elementary 1. OK. Uh, when will classes start? Elementary 1 begins... Uh, just a minute. Uh, it begins on August 10. Great. Now what else do I have to do? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. I'm sorry, Vijay. What were you saying? I wanted to know what else I had to do. Oh, of course. Please go to the building on the other side of Smith Street. I want you to go to the reception area first. It's just inside the door on the left as you enter from Smith Street. Give them this form. OK. Do I pay my fees there? No, but the fees office is in the same building. Go past the escalators and you'll see a games shop. It's in the corner. The fees office is between the games shop and the toilets. Thanks. Uh, where can I buy books? The bookshop is opposite the lifts. It's right next to the entrance from Robert Street. Your offices are spread out. Not as badly as they used to be. By the way, we offer very competitive overseas travel rates to our students. Oh, I'd like to look into that. Of course. The travel agency is at the Smith Street end of the building, in the corner next to the insurance office. Thank you very much. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a university administrator telling a group of new students about the central campus buildings and the facilities they provide. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome everyone to the Brandon Complex, the geographical and we could say spiritual heart of this university. This is basically where everyone eats too, as you can see by looking around. There are many different cuisines here, Chinese, Indian and Middle Eastern, plus the usual fare of a local type, all in that corner over there. We have many shops here too, but the biggest is Wilson's, right there, providing clothing and hardware. That's next to all the restaurants. Now, on the opposite side of Wilson's we have three shops. The one in the corner there, closest to the restaurants, is for DVDs. Yes, the DVDs are cheap and affordable, and you can also rent DVD players as well. Moving on. In the corner directly opposite Wilson's is the Student Union office. Incidentally, you are all encouraged to join the Student Union, as a Student Union card gives you many benefits, including discounts on basically everything you can buy here at the Brandon Complex. Outside this complex, on the other side of the road, you can just see it from here in fact, is a building that we call by the rather unusual name, the H building. Next to this, on the other side of some trees along the main road, is the Engineering Institute, but that doesn't have anything to do with the Brandon complex. One last thing is that just outside this door, near us here, you can see a grassy oval patch, well, that's the playing field for what we simply call the fitness room, which is alongside. So you can put on some calories here at the restaurants and then burn them off at the fitness room afterwards. Oh, I forgot to mention this shop right here, in the middle, beside the student union. It's the bookshop. And, as you can see, it's always busy, always popular. You can buy newspapers, magazines and stationery there, plus a few clothing items as well, just as you can at Wilson's. Why don't you go and take a look right now? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now I'd like to tell you a bit more about one of the buildings here, namely the H building. Despite its bland name, you might be interested in what goes on there. It is our main recreational centre, with halls, offices and space available for a variety of activities, mostly for those who want to get fit. For example, if you're interested in yoga, you're in luck, since four days a week there are free yoga classes. They have several levels, so if you're a beginner, you'd have to start with that. You can check the schedules on the wall there. Yoga used to be at night, but now it's in the mornings, but not on Wednesdays. Along those same lines, there's aerobic dancing in the afternoon. This shares the same room as the badminton games, which are on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. The aerobics are on the alternate days, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it's not restricted at all. Everyone is welcome to join, although the instructor may divide you up, of course, according to ability. And, just to show how diverse the H building is, there's even some spiritual solace available there inside the multi-denominational prayer centre. 
with individual booths and a variety of holy scriptures and texts available to read from all the major religions of the world. That's open all day over the weekend, but not at night time when the rooms are for private booking. Finally, for those of you of a cerebral nature, the University Chess Club operates at night. That's open from 8 p.m. every... Uh, is it Wednesday or Monday? No, sorry, Friday. And I think it closes at about 11.30 p.m. So, there's something for everyone in the H building. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a woman talking about a number of different beaches to a group of tourists. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Right, let's move on to the beaches here which are absolutely beautiful. You do have over a hundred to choose from. They're mostly sandy beaches and they vary from the largest which is two and a half kilometers long to tiny sandy coves but there are a few that I'd really recommend you to visit. So, looking at this pamphlet, first of all, there's Bandela Beach. This beach is one kilometre away from the old fishing village of Bandela, which is a beautiful spot. If you park in the car park behind it, there's a small path which leads down to the bay. It's very pretty because the whole beach is backed by pine trees, so it's very sheltered. The beach itself is very clean and the water is shallow and safe. That, together with the soft sand, make it an ideal beach for children and non-swimmers. Um, a little further round the coast, again to the east, in the eastern corner of the island, is the spectacular Dapolata Beach, which is basically a long inlet. The land around this beach is marshland. It's all marsh. And there's a stream which winds through it and the stream goes into the sea and the beach has lovely pale gold sand. Access to this beach is quite tricky and not for the less energetic. You have to go down a long flight of steps, 190 to be exact, but you'll be relieved to know that there's also a road which winds down to a car parking area. When you're level with the sea, there is a handful of shops and bars and you can hire some beds and umbrellas. Continuing round the island, just past the tip of Calne, is the next beach I'd suggest you visit, and this is San Get. Why? Because there isn't a beach longer than this on the island. If you want to know, it's exactly two and a half kilometres long, and that's a bonus because it means it never gets overcrowded. It has golden sand and clear blue water shelving into the sea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. 
It has golden sand and clear blue water shelving into the sea. There are several beach restaurants to choose from, and water sports are available when the water is calm. But check first. This beach operates a flag system, as the sea can get rough, and you should always swim between the flags. There's a large car park which gives you easy access to the eastern end of the beach, but the western end is much quieter and more wild, as it is harder to reach. Blanaka is another popular beach, just in the northwest corner of the island. It has incredibly white sand and sparkling water. There is ample car parking here and plenty of bars and restaurants. Blanaka has white cliffs all around it. And for those of you who'd like a little more to do than just lazing on the beach, there are caves here which you can explore in the cliffs, and you can also dive into the water from rock platforms along the side of the cove. Well, my final recommendation for today is Dissidor. Now, this beach isn't quite as easy to get to as the others I've talked about. It's quite a remote little beach, tucked away here next to Blanaka. You can reach Dissidor by a steep slope. Which goes over some sandbanks. The beach itself is small and pretty, with reddish-coloured sand and some stony areas on its eastern side. Despite being quite small, the bathing is good, and you can also go fishing here from the rocks at either side. It's a good idea to take some food and drink with you if you decide to go here, as there's only one little bar which isn't always open. So that should give you plenty of ideas to choose from over the next two weeks. And if you have any further questions, that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. You will hear a woman giving a talk at a popular science convention. She is describing research into artificial gills designed to enable humans to breathe underwater. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. In my talk today, I'll be exploring the idea of artificial gills. I'll start by introducing the concept, giving some background and so forth, and then I'll go on to explain the technological applications, including a short, very simple experiment I conducted. Starting with the background. As everyone knows, all living creatures need oxygen to live. Mammals take in oxygen from the atmosphere by using their lungs, and fishes take oxygen from water by means of their gills, which of course, in most fishes, are located either side of their head. But human beings have always dreamt of being able to swim underwater like the fishes, breathing without the help of oxygen tanks. I don't know whether any of you have done any scuba diving, but it's a real pain having to use all that equipment. You need special training, and it's generally agreed that tanks are too heavy and big to enable most people to move and work comfortably underwater. So scientists are trying a different tack. Rather than humans carrying an oxygen supply as they go underwater, wouldn't it be possible to extract oxygen in situ that is, directly from the water, while swimming. In the 1960s, the famous underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau, for example, predicted that one day surgery could be used to equip humans with gills. 
He believed our lungs could be bypassed and we would learn to live underwater just as naturally as we live on land. But of course, most of us would prefer not to go to such extremes. <laughs> I've been looking at some fairly simple technologies developed to extract oxygen from water. Ways to produce a simple, practical artificial gill enabling humans to live and breathe in water without harm. Now, how scientists and inventors went about this was to look at the way different animals handled this. Fairly obviously, they looked at the way fishes breathe but also how they move down and float up to the surface using inflatable sacs called swim bladders. Scientists also looked at animals without gills, which use bubbles of air underwater, notably beetles. These insects contrive to stay underwater for long periods by breathing from this bubble which they hold under their wing cases. By looking at these animal adaptations, inventors began to come up with their own artificial gills. Now, making a crude gill is actually rather easy, more straightforward. You take a watertight box, which is made of a material which is permeable to gas, that is, it allows it to pass through inwards and outwards. You then fill this with air, fix it to the diver's face, and go down under water. But a crucial factor is that the diver has to keep the water moving so that water high in oxygen is always in contact with the gill, so he can't really stay still. And to maximize this contact, it's necessary for your gill to have a big surface area. Different gill designers have addressed this problem in different ways, but many choose to use a network or lattice arrangement of tiny tubes as part of their artificial gills. Then the diver is able to breathe in and out. Oxygen from the water passes through the outer walls of the gill and carbon dioxide is expelled. In a nutshell, that's how the artificial gill works. So, having read about these simple gill mechanisms, I decided to create my own. I followed the procedure I've just described, and it worked pretty well when I tried it out in the swimming pool. I lasted underwater for nearly 40 minutes. However, I've read about other people breathing through their gill for several hours. So the basic idea works well, but the real limitation is that these simple gills don't work as the diver descends to any great depth because the pressure builds, and a whole different set of problems are caused by that. Research is being done into how these problems might be overcome, but that's another story, which has to be a subject of another talk. <laughs> Despite this serious limitation, many people have high hopes for the artificial gill, and they think it might have applications beyond simply enabling an individual to stay underwater for a length of time. For example, the same technology might be used to provide oxygen for submarines, enabling them to stay submerged for months on end without resorting to potentially dangerous technologies such as nuclear power. Another idea is to use oxygen derived from the water as energy for fuel cells. These could power machinery underwater, such as robotic devices. So, in my view, this is an area of technology with great potential. Now, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I yes, um, lady at the That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. I, I, I
feel the blood creeping up from the heathens Got will, got fight, got pride, got reason If they wanna go eat, then you know I'm gon' feed them If you're coming for me, hope you're ready for a demon I got eyes in the back of my head, I'm seeing Take me for granted and you know I'm leaving I'ma take what's mine with the webs I'm weaving I could take this crap from seeing to believe